my name is uh, Jun Yu, I'm uh, the director of the institute. Um, the institute was founded in 2008 uh, with um, uh, the aim to promote studies of the financial economics uh, in areas that are strategically relevant to Singapore economy and the economies in the region. One of the objectives of the Institute is to support Singapore's ambition to uh, be a major international center in the region. Uh, we have uh, four centers uh, operated under the uh, Institute level. Uh, the Center for Financial Econometrics, or COFI, the Center for uh, Asset Securitization and the Management in Asia, or CASA, which is basically the center who uh, organized this uh, public uh, seminar today. The Center for Silver Security, or CSS, and the Center for Corporate and Investors Responsibility, or CCIR. Um, and as some of you may know that, uh, uh, one of our four centers, Coffee, has been trying very hard to introduce a new econometric method to detect the presence of asset bubbles in the time series data and to base them the origination of the asset bubble. This uh, method has you know, been useful for uh, design an early, early warning system that can be useful for uh, regulators. Um, however, after we have detected a bubble, we don't know what to do. Our method doesn't provide an answer to what to do next. Typically, the regulator, after facing a, you know, an asset bubble, they can you know, use physical policies, macro, you know, monetary policies, and the macro prudential policies. The macro prudential policies has gained a lot of popularity among regulators recent years. Today's topic is going to be addressed that right, uh, right uh, issue. So it's uh, my great you know, uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Susan uh, Wachter. Uh, I, I guess, you know, <laughs> Susan has a very, very long, long CV, which may require 100 megabytes a gigabyte of memory, so and that's beyond my brain capacity, so I have to read uh, from the uh, printouts. Um, Susan is a rich, Richard Woolley Chair uh, Professor of uh, Financial Management at Wharton. She served as Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development from 1998 to 2001. This is a pre presidentially appointed and the Senate confirmed position. As a, uh, Assistant Secretary, Susan was a principal advisor to, to the Secretary on national housing and urban uh, policy. Susan has published 150 articles. Uh, which is an amazing number, you know, if you are in the academic circle. She has served as the president of the American Real Estate and the Urban Economic Association and the co-editor of Real Estate Economy, uh, Economics, which is a leading journal uh, in the uh, field of uh, real estate uh, area. She was a chairperson of a Wharton Real Estate Department between 96 and 98. An often quoted authority on mortgage market and current crisis, she has written widely and testified to Congress on related issues. Susan has been a booking fellow, a senior fellow at Urban Land Institute, also a senior fellow of CASA at SKPI in SMU. And she's currently co-director of the Penn Institute for uh, Urban Research. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, please uh, join me to welcome uh, Susan Lockton. Uh, 
So I will be focusing my comments today, uh, first of all, in some uh, uh, discussion that I am going to have, and then with some uh, prepared talk. But I do want to emphasize the importance of hopefully having a conversation afterwards, because the issues that I'm going to be speaking about are very much alive today. And uh, SKBI and the people here I know are working on these issues, and I would very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, engage in an exchange with you uh, as well. So I am, I've titled my talk as Macroprudential Policy After the Great Recession. And we are indeed in a new era of macroprudential policy that is evolving in real time as we speak, not only in response to the crisis and in the U.S. that began the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis, but also in response to two additional crises. So we in the world today are in the midst of three financial crises. The first is uh, one that is in fact waning, and that is the uh, financial crisis that is associated with the subprime bubble in the United States. I will uh, briefly make some comments about why I believe that's waning. The second conference, of course, the second crisis, of course, we are right in the middle of, and it's day by day evolving and causing great volatility in world financial markets, and that is the uh, euro and uh, how the uh, stability of the euro system will evolve day by day. Uh, and the third is uh, the potential crisis coming out of what clearly was a bubble in China, the potential meltdown uh, there. Now that to me is really the uh, most serious in some ways of how that evolves uh, because we in the West are depending on growth of Asia and the growth in Europe is clearly now going to be uh, zero to negative coming in the coming year. Uh, growth in the United States is positive but less than last year because of Europe. So that's part of the waning of the subprime crisis. Uh, we have on all dimensions improvement, very slow improvement, but improvement nonetheless. That is, the unemployment rate for the first time has dropped below 9% since, uh, since the beginning of the crisis since the recession in 2008. It's 8.6%, uh, but nonetheless there is some growth in employment. And we need that growth in employment because that's what the housing market is dependent on, as you probably are aware because of the crisis and declining housing prices of about 30%. Housing prices are more affordable than they ever have been uh, relative to income in the history of America. Also, interest rates and therefore mortgage rates are lower than they have ever been in the history of America. Nonetheless, the housing market has uh, not uh, recovered. It's bouncing on the bottom and maybe, hopefully, in 2013 by uh, predictions and forecasts, uh, various folks including myself, will in fact stabilize in 2013. But in any case, the housing market does not continue to uh, decline. We don't, I did not, in my own forecast, I became brave. Instead of being a two-handed economist, I actually predicted and said, no, we're not going to have a second significant downturn in housing. Uh, of course, we would if there was a severe recession or a, a crisis in uh, Europe that affected interest rates in the United States. So while we see improvement in the US, uh, we don't have yet an understanding in the US of how things are going to change going forward. And I'm going to comment on that in my formal comments in the moment. One of the changes is likely to be macroprudential policy. But how that evolves is, uh, as you will see, very unclear. And will depend in part on tools that are developed by, among others, real estate economists and financial economists working together. Which is why I am so pleased to be here today sharing these thoughts with this ongoing crisis, because it's right here in SKBI as Professor Jamu uh, referred to, that there are, is work going on in this very area. So the third crisis uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is the one right now that's not happening, actually is not happening as the moment as we speak, in part because macroprudential tools were already used, have been already used in the Chinese economy to prick the uh, real estate bubble. The question of whether there will be a soft landing uh, the, weather, the question of whether growth will recede to 8%, uh, 7% uh, uh, predictions uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, Deutsche Bank, for example, or that uh, 
there may be a decline, a substantial decline in China. So the question of whether it's a growth rate, obviously growth rate will still be double that uh, in the Western world. But we in, in the Western world are reliant on the fact that uh, this real estate bubble may have very well been correct in a way that's consistent with sustainable growth in Asia. We will be relying on the sustainable growth in Asia to avoid a global recession. So I will be speaking then um, about the lessons learned and being learned today across the world. And this crisis has made a tremendous difference, the subprime crisis, the financial crisis, the great financial crisis in the way financial and monetary policy is evolving. Well before the financial crisis, around the turn of this century, one of the most widely respected governors of the Federal Reserve System ever presented uh, research, and I happened to be there, presenting my own research, uh, at Jackson Hole, on the Federal Reserve Bank's response to asset price bubbles. And the vast majority of the audience at Jackson Hole that day agreed with Ben Bernanke when he and co-author Mark Gertler of New York University argued that the Federal Reserve Board had no business preemptively deflating excessive appreciation of asset prices. The risks of acting were too high, while the risks of not acting were manageable. Quote, unquote, Chairman Ben Bernanke. I must say that this view is a consensus view, it has been uh, until quite recently a consensus view, and may still be a consensus view among most real estate economists, certainly, and other economists as well. But it, the view is changing rapidly among economists in the Federal Reserve System and other uh, institutional bodies like the International Monetary Fund. I just came from a meeting of the International Monetary Fund where uh, one of the key people in this area laid out the use of macrofinancial policy specifically to deal with asset bubbles uh, going forward. And 12 years and one severe global recession later, <coughs> Chairman Ben Bernanke opened the Fed's mandate in a conference a few weeks ago at Boston that I happened to be at to include quote unquote financial stability goals. For the first time, this was enumerated in the U.S. as a goal of the Federal Reserve System. As Bernanke there stated, quote, the current framework for monetary policy will remain the standard approach, unquote. But he went on to point to, quote, the importance of anticipating and diffusing threats to financial stability before they inflict damage on the financial system and the economy. That it took such a monumental failure of the global financial system to explore this, these policy options of macroprudential policy speaks volumes about the cautious evolution of the Federal Reserve and other central bankers' official mandate across the world. So let me talk a little bit about the evolution of that official mandate. Because one thing that we, there will be two areas that we will have to uh, do considerable work going forward. One, if we are going to, in fact, deflate asset bubbles as they are emerging, we are going to have to measure them. Two, we are going to have to develop tools, as Professor uh, Junyu just mentioned, and the tools will have to be implemented by some agency or agencies. What will that agency be? Will it be the Federal Reserve Board in the U.S.? Will it be the Treasury in the U.S.? And will it be uh, central banks in other countries? Will it uh, come out of the separate financial institutions? Uh, these are very carefully thought through issues in the issue of monetary and fiscal policy. And now we have the third leg in our, potentially in our set of goals, not only uh, fiscal uh, 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 stability, but financial stability as well as inflation and monetary stability. So how we work these out not only requires education tools, but also institutional change for implementation. So let me talk a little bit about the institutional issues, which again was very much the subject of this meeting that I just came from. So the Federal Reserve, for those of you um, who, including myself, this is actually all new to me as well, as we attempt to think these thing, things through for uh, policy in the United States, as I myself am asked by bodies, well, uh, where should this reside? Uh, what should be the role, for example, of the department that, as Professor uh, just mentioned, I head up, which had over 100 researchers looking at uh, housing prices and uh, uh, rents and uh, the stability of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, obviously, uh, despite that, I didn't do a particularly good job, but leave that aside. 
So those tools obviously themselves need to be developed as well as institutions that would implement them. So the Federal Reserve Board as an institution dates back to 1913. The original purview of the Fed over policy did not, however, begin until after World War II. Uh, in the wake of the Great Depression is when the Federal Reserve uh, was given the mandate to oversee economic growth through, uh, through um, central banking activities. But by the 1970s, economic growth was no longer the issue. The issue was the central challenge had been was inflation and global inflation. So starting in the 1970s, the Federal Reserve System central banks across the world switched their focus uh, to uh, inflation and monetary stability. Quote, um, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Unquote. That was said by macroeconomists in the room. Friedman. Yes. Friedman. An A to that person. <laughs> Yes, everywhere, always and everywhere monetary phenomenon. Uh, that, I think, is now absolutely consensus view. And thus was born the Humphrey Hawkins Act, which changed the Federal Reserve's mandate. When combined with the money supply uh, restriction of newly appointed Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, who implemented the new policies, uh, the Humphrey Hawkins Act transformed stagflation of the 70s into the great moderation of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. In this financial crisis. This is true not only in the United States, but across the world. We have come through a period starting in, in, uh, 19, uh, in, in the 1970s of great moderation. So we've had decades, 40 years, of growth, low interest rates, declining interest rates, dramatically declining interest rates, which is both a effect of declining interest rates inflation rates and reflects declining interest rates. Now part of this uh, decline in interest rates uh, occurred as, federal, as central banks across the world adopted monetary policies to contain inflation. Many of you may not uh, have, the, have the memory of the 70s where inflation rates in many countries were double digit, triple digit inflation rates. This is no more. And as the threat of inflation decreased, uh, so did interest rates, which reflected the threat of future uh, high inflation rates. What actually resulted in this was three factors. First, a monetary policy that tracked very carefully inflation and put into place uh, rules to track inflation. When was inflation too high? How would the rules through not through discretion, but automatically step in. Rules such as the Taylor's rule became Taylor rule became adopted worldwide. The third piece of this uh, new tools, new uh, uh, legal and institutional change uh, that gave the tools to central banks. The third was the role of the private sector, bond vigilantes. So bond vigilantes across the world followed threat of stepping away from these rules of contained monetary supply growth and therefore the potential of inflation eruption. Private sector bond vigilantes move global capital flows away from countries and punish countries immediately, instantaneously, when it looked as though inflation would erupt again. Maybe not quite, that's an exaggeration, but certainly we're punishing. Now, therefore, inflation came under control. And the positive side of controlling inflation was that interest rates dropped precipitously from an average across the OECD of more than 15% in the 1980s to less than 6% in 2000. What cut the cost by half. Now, even in developing countries, these tools were adopted and interest rates dropped tremendously in countries such as China, where now one could, in fact, invest in the future and borrow for good investment at historically low rates. In some ways, I believe, although this cannot be proven, uh, that the bond vigilantes and this great success has set up the stage for the uh, second and third crises, that the second crisis uh, that we are in now, uh, and, or, or uh, the first and second of the, of the three crises that we are potentially in right now. Particularly the fiscal issue, bond vigilantes no longer concerned that they would not get paid back on their long-term lending 
are willing to lend more and longer because the threat of inflation to undermine the payback of the loans is no longer there. That means that they, just like a driver, the seatbelt might be more reckless, behavioral uh, uh, studies so show, perhaps was part of the ability across the world for governments to take on more debt. Because the bond vigilante said, we won't be paid back. The taxing authority is there, and the ability to inflate is no longer there. So we will be, be, we will be paid back in the cost of dollars. So um, that may be part of it. The other may, in the same way, may be part of the over-lending and over-leveraging in the banking sector that led to the crisis, uh, uh, the great financial crisis, which I am going to continue then speaking about. So um, we then had official policy, as I said, in the U.S. and across the world, on the Hawkins Act in the U.S., to um, uh, systematic use of, um, of uh, policy, which was twofold. One, to keep inflation under control, and two, to uh, look to inflation in the short run to deal with the output gap. So the question is today whether similarly we have arrived at yet a new beginning where the Fed and other central banks will have a new mandate, not just these two mandates of monetary stability both uh, in terms of the output gap and long run inflation, but also financial stability. Much as the Bocor error turned the tide toward proactive monetary policy, the 2010s appear to be likely to refocus the, the profession, economists, public economists at, at the Fed and elsewhere on macro prudential uh, financial policies. Economists throughout the world, in fact, monetary authorities, central banks, and elsewhere. So my, as my comments today, however, indicate, um, any such transformation to be successful will require si significant improvement in our understanding of asset price bubbles, especially in real estate. Beginning with an acceptance of the synchronicity uh, and uh, in research on the synchronicity between the real estate cycle and the debt cycle. And for the put, putting into place uh, tools that relate the debt cycle and real estate cycle. Surveillance, uh, tools to identify, tools to implement responses. So let me now step back and tell you where I see the surveillance is leading uh, and what we've learned and what uh, uh, central banks appear to be learning as they consider macro prudential policy across the world. So when left to the devices of the market, real estate debt is inherently, real estate debt is inherently pro-cyclical. Why is that? Real estate debt expands when real estate prices rise because the controls on real estate debt are such like value, debt to income ratios, therefore as the prices increase, so, do, so does lending. More than that, uh, because in a rising price environment, it is often interpreted that a rising price environment with adaptive expectations will continue, that it's safer to lend in this environment. More than that, uh, because of the uh, incentive structure, misaligned incentives, there may also be, and we're all hazard, hazard issues in the banking sector, uh, the fee-driven short-term volume of remuneration and profits argued for issuing loans when the loan, when there is a market for issuing loans. So with adaptive expectations, as real estate prices rise, and households believe real estate prices will continue to rise, so better buy today, because you otherwise may never be able to buy, and then those prices, expectations, as uh, research has shown, get embedded into the prices, the banking sector lends based on current prices, and indeed, perhaps, raises loan to value ratios. So, um, uh, and then, the pro-cyclical factor is then uh, absolutely evidenced, of course, in the U.S. experience, where we had the greatest run-up in household debt in America's history, and it coincided with the highest appreciation of real estate. That debt increase was not in corporates. The corporate sector has actually debt has remained very much under control, and until the crisis, the run-up in debt was not in the um, in government either. 
The run-up in debt was in household debt, which was almost entirely in mortgage debt, but not in consumer debt. The second run-up in debt, uh, starting in 1995 up until 2007-8, uh, the run -up, second run-up in debt beside household debt and mortgage debt, uh, which, by the way, mortgage debt went from six from uh, from, uh, 20, from uh, 25 percent of the value of houses to, on average, 60 percent of the value of homes. Now that may sound like not very much leverage, like, uh, 60 percent of value, but understand that 50 percent of households in America do not have mortgage loans. So we are speaking on the margin of mortgage debt to uh, loan, which was nearing 100 uh, percent. Very difficult to measure precisely, but some studies say over. So the mortgage debt increased dramatically uh, uh, among a segment, but nonetheless increased dramatically. Secondly, uh, also financial debt increased. So not only was there leverage, uh, the, the home collateral value was leveraged in the form of mortgage, uh, mortgage loans, which were then back to mortgage-backed securities, but the mortgage-backed securities were then used uh, to leverage collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. So there was leverage by the financial sector, which was extraordinarily exposed. Basically, the system was a put option on housing prices continuing to rise. These were bets that house prices would continue to rise because the loans could not be repaid back unless housing prices continued to rise. Now, under the circumstances, of how, was this, how did this happen? What was the explanation? There was twofold explanation. I was in the middle of seeking out this explanation in a number of venues in 2005 and 2006 when it was quite obvious uh, that real estate prices were being ratified, that had been pushed up originally by uh, underwriting that was deteriorating, uh, and then uh, loans were being made and ratified, and more loans were being made. So the answer was two, two on the part of the um, monitors. The monitors, including, I'm sorry to say, uh, my old group at, uh, at HUD, including uh, even uh, the overseers of Fannie and Freddie, uh, across the board. The two things were being said. Uh, one was that um, collateral is rising. No problem. Two, that there had never been a recession in housing prices in the United States except when unemployment increased. And and even when unemployment increased, recession was only 1 or 2% nationally in housing prices. Therefore, the solution was to diversify. So if you were diversified, then in fact you would not suffer when housing prices declined because prior to that we only had housing prices decline regionally, not nationally. And even if it was national, it was only by a small amount. So the argument was across the board housing prices can't fall because they haven't fallen. They have to fall. So therefore, they can't Because diversification will solve that problem. But the diversification actually turned around to be the critical problem which caused the financial freeze, which then caused it all to unravel. It was the very fact that the mortgages that were being made, the toxic mortgages, were diversified in pools across the board, the CDOs that were held not only in many institutions in the United States, but in Europe as well. Uh, in across uh, the world institutions was, and these were not monitored or surveyed where these debts were, who owned the mortgage-backed securities and the underlying mortgages, uh, what part of the pools they were. All institutions were, in fact, under threat. All institutions were perceived as not only a liquid but potentially insolvent that were exposed to mortgage-backed securities. So the result was a freezing of credit, and of course the collapse of the entire mortgage industry that provided the mortgage-backed securities. None of the institutions that originated survived, the private mortgage-backed securities. The collapse, of course, of Lehman, their Stearns first, it was not bailed out, and then Lehman, which then was bailed out. Their exposure was entirely to MBS. The lesson learned from Bear Stearns is that perhaps we have to bail out Lehman, or perhaps we did. Uh, was, was a universal call, uh, and then, of course, the TAR bailing out the entire financial system in the United States, the banking system, <coughs> as well as including the bailout of Fannie and Freddie. And Fannie and Freddie, too, were uh, exposed because although they were not issuing the private label mortgage backed securities, by law they could not issue the private label mortgage backed securities, what they could do 
was they could purchase for their portfolio the AAA portion, the tranche portion of the MBS, and they did so, and they also got a uh, change in the regulation through Congress, which allowed not in 2004, 3, 4, and 5, when the private label was expanding tremendously, but allowed in 2006 and 7, when, the, when in fact we were already at the peak and slightly, slightly turning down, which allowed Penny and Freddie to ensure what's called Alt-A mortgages. Sounds good, right? Alt-A mortgages. Not A mortgages, but Alt-A mortgages. Uh, at that point, Fannie and Freddie's market share had been decreased by one third because the private label mortgage backed securities had eaten into their market share with their huge expansion in 2003, 2004, and 2005. And Fannie and Freddie's shareholder owned. And their CEOs and others were incentivized in terms of the payment me mechanism by their shares, which were declining as their, 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 their uh, equity price was going down, as their stock price was going down, as their market share was going down. CEOs were incentivized by their own payment um, to respond quickly to that, which they did by pushing through in 2006-7 the potential purchase of Alt-A just at the first time. What is Alt-A? So Alt-A was part of a heterogeneous set of mortgages that were issued by the mortgage backs, the private label mortgage uh, securitizers starting in 2003-04. These mortgages, these non-traditional products, leaving aside Alt-A for a moment, included teaser rate arms, which were not affordable if in two or three years when the teaser set when it came due. Not a problem. The uh, banks and the uh, borrowers who were receiving these were told because housing prices are increasing. So two, three years after you keep, if you keep payment before the teaser sets, before the teaser resets, if you keep paying, in two or three years, you will be able to refinance out. Your credit will now be cured, will be improved. Yes, true, you're getting a subprime loan today. Keep paying that. Two, three years from now, you'll be able to uh, get a prime loan. And um, prime loan being the loans which at that point were being issued by Fannie and Freddie and were, of course, extremely cheap. And uh, uh, were, this is a route to becoming uh, uh, financially solvent to, to go from consumer credit to uh, 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 subprime credit and then to prime credit. So adjustable rate arms, but then after that um, was, um, even that wasn't good enough to, to qualify enough borrowers, new mortgages were brought in to qualify even more borrowers. But were new mortgages, interest only. So you only had to pay interest. Now that wasn't enough. So negative amortization, which means that actually you start out and pay uh, your interest less than your interest rate over time. So you pay you put less than the interest rate over due. That's how we got loan to value ratios, one of the ways which was over 100%. The other way, the next set of loans, which were even uh, more, uh, uh, you could sell them more, you could get more borrowers into the system, were option arms. Option arms mean, uh, means what? Option to do what? Option to pay whatever you want or nothing. Whatever you want, whatever you want, or nothing. It's your option. Just come in here, take a loan, pay the fees. We'll put the fees into the loan. We'll, we'll book the fees now. And you pay back whatever you want. Whatever you want. The last in our set of toxic instruments was Alt-A. Alt-A, again, sounds much better than the B and the C of these others. But Alt-A was um, used to be a niche product for self-employed who could not verify their income. So uh, you would look at these self-employed called thick file very carefully to see what other sources of funding they might have. Well, all that went across the board. So all day was, we're not going to check your income. And besides, if you tell us your income, we'll tell you to cross it out. Because we don't want to know. Because we don't want to track to see whether this loan is affordable. These became known as liar loans in the great trinity of uh, uh, loans that were um, no income, no collateral, uh, no assets, ninja loans. I'm forgetting one of the J's, not sure. But in any case, ninja loans. Just at that point, Fannie Freddie stepped in to purchase the all-day loans, giving a substantial 
source of funding and bring themselves down as a result. Now, what did investors know and what did the Fed know? This is extremely important if we are to monitor and set up tools going forward because it is particularly real estate asset movements that are synch uh, synchronized with debt booms that are of concern to the overall economy. Why is that? It's because when the crisis in real estate that occurs, a real estate crisis decline, there will be a decline, there will be a crisis in the financial sector, which will build on itself. Because at that point, when the financial sector shuts down, then the real estate pricing will, in fact, decline even more, leading to the negative cycle, self-reinforcing, which will have no alternative but to be bailed out by the lender of last resort, then leading to a debt crisis. So let me comment right now about the debt crisis, this second crisis, as this first crisis now uh, wanes, the second crisis, the debt crisis, uh, of course, is what is the major concern in front of us today. So.